Matt, do you think we should start? Yeah, I'm happy to start, yeah. Okay. Brilliant, so I'm just, okay, so this will be recorded as well. So hopefully the rest of the, the people that signed up <laughs> uh, will be able to um, listen to your wonderful talk later, Matt. Um, hi everyone, um, thank you for joining um, us today. Bed City is very, very proud to be hosting this webinar. Um, I just wanted to give a brief introduction uh, to Bed City, just for those who is not familiar with us, uh, before handing over to Matt to uh, talk to us about the wonderful work he's doing uh, with World of Vets International in Ghana. Okay, so who, who are we? Um, we are a veterinary owned and led global provider of veterinary support services. And we are very passionate to provide that expert advice and support to veterinary teams all over the world. And as you can see here, we have uh, three different um, supporting services we provide. So we've got the teleradiology, teleconsulting and the education services. So with teleradiology, we provide remote reading of x-rays, CTs, MRI and nuclear imaging, and that covers all species. So that includes equine, small animal, large animals, exotic as well. Um, and we are very um, well known for our rapid turnaround times, as well as our educated annotated reports. With the teleconsulting, um, it's a service that uh, provides you access to specialists fairly instantly, um, and that covers all specialties. So that allows you to speak to specialists either through a phone call, uh, text chat, appointment, written report, whatever, however you feel comfortable talking to them. And that's around patients, side advice, clinical cases, just anything you want, just a check-in really um, with a specialist. And that, that interaction can continue for up to two weeks after initial case admission as well. And then we've got our education service, and that includes interactive um, online courses, as well as remote radiology support. Um, so that includes virtual locums as well as resident training. We are very passionate about sustainability and um, leaving a legacy um, to, to the world, to the, to the veterinary um, industry, veterinary world as well. And what we've created um, as part of this whole focus that we've got around sustainability um, is a survey. So we really want your help today. Um, and what we want is your input um, on where you think we should focus our efforts around sustainable, sustainability and the project that we want to work on. Um, so there's some benefit for you as well, as well as for WVI. Um, and for any completed um, survey, uh, we will donate five pounds to the uh, World of Vets International. And you've got a chance to win an Apple AirPod. So win-win for everyone, hopefully. Um, we will. I will put the link in, um, in the chat so it's the end of the webinar, so um, you can listen to Matt first, and I will also share a, um, a key or a code as well, so whatever works for you, but please, that will be much appreciated. We also started working with World Love Aids Internationals last year, I believe now, Matt, isn't it? Um, and yeah. that was really to help raise awareness of the amazing work that you guys are doing. Um, and we had a bit of fun last year. We we um, started a global fundraising for the Vet CT team <laughs> to I'll share the map to sort of cycle, swim, kayak, walk around around the world to cover to, to sort of reach the different project sites that, um, that World of Vets International is involved in. And hence the reason we are um, at Ghana today, aren't we, Matt? Um, <laughs> and we raised just over 7,000 um, pounds, uh, we believe, um, last year um, to, to um, support WVI and the amazing, amazing stuff they're doing. Um, and other projects as well, which I won't go into, I will share our, our, um, the link to the website as well, is um, uh, Sea Turtle uh, Reporting Service, free reporting uh, service to rescue sea turtles, our uh, ongoing relationship with Vet Sustain, Project Ukraine as well, and then the RCVS Refugee Project. So um, there's a lot going on. Um, but over to you now, Matt. I'm going to stop talking and... Um, Enjoy that and enjoy the talk. Um, so Matt, I believe you are 
on the Bean Council and past BVNA president as well. And uh, no, no I've, I've never been BVNA president. You promoted me already. <laughs> Well, you might be soon, but yes. Um, no, and you're obviously working with uh, uh, Wild Events International and getting involved in all these different projects as well. Um, so anything else you want to share before you start the talk? Uh, no, I think we'll start and then people can just ask questions as as as, um, as they feel. We'll, we'll cover everything, hopefully, that they need, and then people can ask questions at the end. So, um, okay, Brilliant. There we go. Okay. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so hopefully you can all see that. So uh, firstly, thank you to um, Betsy T for inviting us to do the webinar today. Um, we, I think it is clear to, it's clear to me and the reason I work with Wildlife Vets International is they're very different to other wildlife organizations. There's a lot more kind of clarity and transparency and not loads of people being employed it's a lot more um kind of ad hoc and we we raise funds and 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 just do do some amazing work in the field and and again i can't thank vet ct for supporting us with the sea turtle stuff we did last year and hopefully we'll have more collaborations around the mangabe work so um none of these things happen um kind of by accident they're all about relationships and we'll, we'll come back to that a bit later so but yeah a little bit about wildlife vets international so we train veterinary professionals around the world on the front line of conservation, looking at disease and risk assessment and, and trying to do our bit to maintain wild populations, but also introduce endangered species back into the world. And it's, it's a complicated one. And we are all about education, legacy and sustainability in those sectors. It's very easy to kind of sweep in and do some amazing work and then leave again. And if you don't uh, provide kind of educational and remote support and training, doesn't really work so and we work with a variety of species my my three areas i work for for wildlife vets international are vultures in india uh the mankabi project which we're going to talk about today and then sea turtles in various places as well so and i think um yeah it's it's being involved in wild animals um, conservation through veterinary training is a, an amazing opportunity so the first question is really why we work with WAPCA, so West African Primate Conservation Action, and why now really for this project? So it, again, this started a long time ago. Um, the, the little mangabe we can see is called Conchita, and the person in the picture standing to me, next to me, who I make look incredibly small, because she is quite small, um, is Andrea Dempsey. And Andrea Dempsey is the program manager for uh, WAPCA in Ghana. So she lives in the UK, but she spends a lot of time in Ghana. And Andrew and I met uh, at ZSL London Zoo many, many years ago. And she hand reared this mangabe called Conchita, who interestingly has since gone on to produce babies, one of which is back in Ghana now. So has gone back into Ghana to be part of the, the kind of foundation group. So I, ca I can't um, emphasize enough how what an amazing primatologist Andrew is. She has an amazing amount of kind of tenacity and dedication. And, and uh, yeah, she's an incredible force for good so it seemed a natural collaboration and she finds herself in a situation in Ghana that uh, really fits the skill set that, that WVI can support her with. Um, and they, they're, they're different. They're just different to other conservation organisations in how they approach it holistically and look at the challenges within the environment and also with the people. So I was just going to mention uh, one of the things that really, really shone out to me as being an amazing incentive that, that WAP could do. And it's called the the, the cremas, and uh, I get told off for calling it the creamers, which is something um, to do with cakes, which I think I'm drawn to. But essentially, they work with the communities to create these community resource management areas. And um, what this means is is that they look at the community and see what resources are there, and help them develop protocols and management systems to allow them to optimize the the, the resources that they have. So um, a good example of that is that they produce coconut oil and what WAPCA has done is provide the ability for the coconut oil to be produced organically, processed organically, and then sold directly to a company for a huge amount more money than it was getting sold before their intervention. So it's an amazing initiative that captures um, a lot of the stuff that other conservation institutions forget and its engagement from the, 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 the people living in those areas. 
Um, and I've put a link in here, which I'm sure Will Marie can share as well, that gives a, a short video on YouTube that explains more about how the um the, the cremas work in, in West Africa. But the the initiatives are done, and it's not not just coconut oil, there's lots of different things, and it provides that community with a source of financial stability, which enables them to not have, to, enables them to feel more positive about the primates in that area and not have to use them as a resource themselves. So if you get a moment later, just have a look at that. So the collaboration itself is all around the white naped mangabe. These are incredible primates. I mean, they're so charismatic, they're cheeky, they're kind of, they're smart. They've just got lots of lots of characteristics that um, I, I shouldn't anthropomorphize, but they're just amazing little animals. Um, there's a group being held in Kamasi Zoo in an enclosure that I'll show you a video about that have the potential out of the 12, there's a potential for 10 of them to, to, to possibly be released. And I'll say this a lot during this presentation, the, the, the decision to release these animals is not with WVI. And that's one of the things that sometimes gets a bit confusing with, with veterinary support and conservation societies. And um, essentially this will always sit with Wapka and Andrea and her team. They're in control of that. We, we're just going to hopefully put them in a position that when they feel ready and they have the resources and they're comfortable, they can or maybe cannot release these primates. And I think that's one of the things that sometimes goes wrong is that people kind of decide their own direction without actually speaking to them. But uh, they're, in, they're in this forest enclosure, which is huge. Um, I think it's about 200 square meters and, and it's got lots of, local native plants including food plants in it and it's incredibly densely packed um and the the primates have access to go in and out of this as they wish they keep the human contact to a minimum uh, they try not to give them any kind of um positive reinforcement to human behavior the food is put in another area and then the primates are allowed in there so they do have some interaction but it's absolutely minimal we we started to work on the disease risk analysis and i'll come back to that later and looking at the screening protocols. And these are all pretty much in place now and have been looked at by various uh, experts in the field. So we've, we've made quite a lot of progress. We've been working with WAPCA for about four years, uh, obviously COVID in the middle, but yeah, we've been working four years. Um, and WAPCA have scoped out two potential uh, release locations. Um, and interestingly, they're quite different. One has no mangabe population at all, but has great topography. So it's um, it's very hilly and would be hard for anybody to get into to do, if they wanted to do any kind of damage to the primates, they wouldn't be able to get into them because it's quite um, um, kind of hilly and, and difficult to get to. That obviously has a challenge from post-release screening and, and sorry, post-release monitoring as well for WAPCA itself. And the second site is a low population of mangabees. Um, but it's easier to monitor. So it's a bit flatter and it's an area that is well um, documented by biologists. So, and again, this will be down to WAPCA to decide where, where, if and when these primates get released. We've got great engagement from the government now. Uh, they're hugely supportive. Um, Andrew and I had a meeting with them time before last when I was in Ghana. They've offered uh, guards, the army, various kind of resources. To, to really be able to support the post-release monitoring. And I think that's going to be the really, really useful. They've also looked at, um, Andrea herself has gone out and talked to biologists and put in place a, plans for release monitoring. And they're looking at some kind of new methodology with the new systems we have. So one of the, one of the really interesting ones they're looking at is facial recognition software. So setting it up so that the primates can look into something at a feed station and then they actually be able to, to to tell which one that is and that's something that's been developed with um, a university in the UK. So this was one of our first big meetings so uh, me, myself and Andrea with all of the the people in charge of the Forestry Commission in Ghana so um, the, these people really are fundamental in 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 supporting this project and they're hugely supportive as, of WAPCA and WVI um, they 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 embrace the opportunity for us to share our knowledge and experience and that's really really great um, and they they're passionate about their wildlife they, they really are so just a little bit about disease risk assessments is um th these are not very exciting on face value and they take a lot of time to develop but they're basically there to look at what your aims are and if there's anything you can do to to mitigate any threats to this this release or this um this population. 
they also look at um, establishing translocation pathways. So how are these animals going to be moved? What, what's going to be the processes involved? Will they get exposed to any diseases during that translocation? These sort of things are crucial in these processes. And uh, look at all the hazards. So that's biological hazards, also hazards from people. So looking at infectious diseases. So uh, Ghana has had Ebola in the past. Um, they, 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 there are you know threats in there that have to be accounted for and, and be be risk assessed. Um, risk assessments are something that are are very challenging, but we do need to look at the risk involved in in these areas and how um, how we can try and make reduce those risks as much as possible. And that risk management takes many facets. So it's about talking to various people, but also looking if there's any systems of work we can put in place. Communicating risk can be really challenging because it's not very dynamic and it's also quite unpredictable so you 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 kind of work for west you look at worst case scenarios but you hope for the best and always in my mind and in andrew's mind top of our list is trying to maintain animal welfare now we have to be honest with ourselves putting animals into anesthesia and, and moving them around and things you are going to compromise their animal their their welfare slightly but it's just about making sure that we absolutely minimise what a negative impact we have on their welfare. And one of the things that I learned at ZSL and was spoken to and was often gets forgotten is just knowing when the end point will occur. So knowing what the actual point is where, what success, what good looks like. And for WVI and WAPCA, this really is getting them in a position that we've trained their in situ Ghanaian vets and we've got them in a position that they can carry out this screening and and uh, re uh, conservation translocation work without us having to go there at all. So we would continue to provide remote support, but we'd like to put the training in place with their vets. But actually, they're, they're very capable. They're very nice people, very competent. They just need a little bit of support on the kind of practical side of it. And if we put that in place, it would mean that that would make the, the project much more sustainable. So we have to look at the reasons why the decline has, has happened. So WAPCA have done this. They've looked at specific areas and they've done lots of education and stuff around um, primates as pets um, and also as primates as food sources. We've we've done our disease risk analysis and we consider that to be due diligence. So we've done all the bits we can. And that's a, um, an ongoing project. That, that document itself will continue to grow and get monitored. We, we have to look at the unknowns, and this is really challenging, but what we do is, is we look at room, um, different populations of different species of primates, see what sort of challenges they're faced in there, look at countries like Cote d'Ivoire and other countries that border Ghana and see what challenges the primates have had in there. It's, it's, it's kind of a bit, um, what's the word, kind of optimistic that we should be able to predict these things, but I think, we again, we just need to make sure we've done everything we can. The pre-release facilities need to be in place and they are at Kamasi Zoo. Um, and the monitoring system is very much down to um, WAPCA themselves to put those systems in place. And they will have specific trained biologists. Again, it's about knowing our remit as WBI. We, we wouldn't want to necessarily be involved in that element. We need to find appropriate levels of funding to place sustainability. So we need to make sure that we can continue to monitor and engagement from the government. As I say, the government essentially um, they, they, they really are in control of all of the animals in Ghana. So um, it, it, it's what it falls down to one person that, that is in charge of all of the animals. And that includes cats and dogs and, and other pet animals as well. So um, we, need, we need to engage with them as, and make sure that they're completely invested and committed to what we're doing. And again, we do our animal welfare assessment and assess it and document it realistically. And, and just, yeah, really just to make sure that it's clear that WAPCA makes that final decision. We're not going to force them or, or if it's not the right thing to do. It would be a lovely thing to do and it would be great to do, but it's not our decision. And, and really, we don't, we're not going to interfere with that. We're just going to put them in a position that they can do it and they can decide when, it, when everything aligns that is suitable to do. So I just want to talk a little bit about risk. So risk is one of those things that we we talk about it a little bit, but we don't really think about. And often it sneaks up on you. It is one of those things that you don't necessarily predict. Um, you do your best to, to think of all the positive options. But unlike this person here, you try not to ev evoke risk. You try not to push yourself into risks. And what we all need to do is to make sure it's clear that once we, we do have some risk and something goes wrong, 
we need to make sure that there's systems in place to be able to document that risk and then go back and reassess our, our protocols. Just to say this guy was absolutely fine. Um, I just, it just makes me think about how um, risk works and just looking at how you have to have support and systems in place. His support is not particularly appropriate, but just, just really the point is, it's just risk is very unpredictable. Okay, so um, I just wanted to show you the um, enclosure at Kamasi. So this is quite a big video. I hope it's hopefully it's going to play all right for us. So it's a very big, um, it's a large enclosure. It has uh, fencing around the outside, very, very tall, well-established trees. It has an electric fence um, powered by solar panels. The, the primates don't really interact with the electric fence. They they know that um, they they know that that what it is, and they just basically have nothing to do with it. Um, and that's powered by solar panels. You just see one of the tunnels on the left there that allows them to access the inside area. This enclosure is well designed. It has lots of trees in it that are suitable for for food plants. Um, it's very quiet. It's tucked away in the back of the zoo um, to, in a place that actually the public don't ever go to. And if you didn't know it was there, you'd never find it. So it's, yeah, it's absolutely ideal. It has a 24 hour security guard. And the security guard is not there really to protect the primates. It's more to stop people from um, stealing the, the solar panel units. They're very kind of sought after in Ghana. So he's there just to protect that and also damaging any um, fences and things that people might want to try and take. So this is one of the a picture of one of the proposed release sites that Andrew shared with me. And I think you can see there is a similarity, these very tall trees, densely planted. So we're kind of setting them up to succeed. So we're giving them the opportunity to experience this, this kind of enclosure beforehand. So what it's all about. So this is uh, yellow. So yellow was a, 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 is a small mangabe male that was found in one of the rural communities. Um, as a pet, he's about three or four years old. His mother was probably killed for food, so probably killed for meat, and they kept her had kept yellow as as a, as a pet. Uh, he was spotted by Wapka. Wapka, um, with the with the support of the government, went and took him, um, and now are trying to rehabilitate him back to being a primate. So he has a teddy because it's a kind of substitute for his mum. And just really just, yeah, this is what for me is what it's all about. If we can, although yellow is is so um, habituated to people and, and, and has some habits that would mean that he probably would not be releasable as far as, again, that would be down to WAPCA, but they probably wouldn't release him. He could he could essentially provide um, um, a, a, a gene pool, a, a new genetic, um, a novel genetic line within the collection. Um, that, that could produce individuals that could be released. So it's actively happening. You know, this is still an ongoing process. And it, and to see him just makes me realise that we have absolutely have to do everything within our powers to, to get this happening. So hazard identification. Uh, this is Berberi macaques. So this is in India. We've swapped countries briefly. Um, but this was one, an, an individual that had been a pet. And we when we're looking at these risk, so risk identification, we need to use our clinical eyes as well as everything else. So those of you that are uh, very astute and, and can spot things will see that the, in the picture on the left, you can see that in the crook of his arm, he has lots of scabs and a bit of hair loss. And indeed he had mange and um, probably caught from people. Um, so we had to consider him um, not particularly suitable for release with, with mange. We wouldn't want to risk introducing anything into the, into the population that could, could cause any kind of problems. Um, sorry for the gory picture, but we do need to think about the sustainability of releasing as well. Um, sex dynamics will make a difference to release. This is a grey tufted uh, langur, again in India, where these males that are kind of sub adults, they will get attacked by other males if they're released in the wrong place. So having some ongoing support is absolutely crucial. And, and the, the importance of that is can never be underestimated. We have to consider that actually the the high profile part, the, the kind of charismatic part or the part that's seen as desirable is actually just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the start of things. So one thing that we've been doing in, in Ghana uh, as WVI has been providing bespoke training to the vets. So we're really just spending time out there with the, the government vets, teaching them 
in this instance, we were teaching about primate pathology. WVI provided this um, pathology grab bag. So we were keen to try and make sure that as part of our disease risk analysis, we've really looked at any primates that might die in the collection or perhaps um, come in dead to the collection that, 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 to make sure that we're gathering as much clinical information as we can. And this would be considered due diligence. And my, my job was to make sure that this training was done in a way that is achievable. You can't, the, the, the level of pathology that you can do in the field is quite different to what you might do in, in practice or in a laboratory in the UK. It's about getting as much information with as little amount of time, investment and equipment. So, and communicating risk. So we, we, we had a long discussion with the whole of the WAPCA team. These are the keepers that look after the primates at, at, at Accra Zoo uh, in, in Accra itself. Um, and there's a whole team of them and they're, they're amazingly dedicated people and they really spend a lot of time trying to facilitate all of the requests that WAPCA have and they're excellent. We provided them with that big red bag, which is a clinical bag. And again, it was something that they 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 identified that they could really use would be a bag that enabled them to go out into communities or anywhere really and have all the equipment they needed to do to carry out a health check. So uh, as my part of WVR, with support of lots and lots of other institutions and companies provided that bag for them. So they now use it you know, regularly as part of their resources. So one thing that um, is important is engagement. So last time we were in Ghana, Andrew and I provided um, two, two or three hour sessions on looking after primates in captivity and also how to handle primates in a welfare minded way. We talked about nutrition and, and lots of different things. And what we did was to try and ensure engagement was we spoke to the people that were likely to come and we asked them what would make them definitely come. And they identified beer and pies, which um, quite easy to achieve. I, I, I think of the things that you do in your life that seem fairly strange, going into a baker's in Ghana um, and ordering 60 meat pies definitely felt a little bit strange, um, but it got really good engagement. They were really happy to be there and they were able, some of the people working in these zoos are not very well paid and they were very pleased to be able to take some pies home to their families as well. And what it meant was, was that they meant that they attended and they were super keen to be involved. So just a little bit of, um, again, just making sure that you're in, uh, it was important to me to make sure I engaged properly with the people that we were trying to support. So animal welfare again, this is um, just looking at suitability to um, release. Not all animals are gonna be suitable for release. This is a great tufted langer that has got some sort of spinal injury that was that was considered that she could be released in India, but I think it's clear to see that she's never going to be able to live out a full life. So th these animals need to be um, need to be managed as captive animals or euthanized, which obviously is challenging in, in India. But um, we we mustn't try and think that it's possible to save everything because it, it absolutely isn't. Lots of work being done about captive breeding populations producing babies to be released back into the world. That itself has lots and lots of facets, especially in primates, but um happy to chat about that another time. But it, it could it needs a lot of space and a lot of resources. Um while they're in captivity, if they're going to stay in captivity, it's important that we try and look after their mental health. So primates are, are you know, are are smart animals, then they're, they're not um their cognitive ability is high. So providing enrichment for them is, is very important. If it's a primate that's never going to be released, that enrichment doesn't need to be particularly natural. We're not teaching it to do things in the wild. We're just teaching it to use its brain and stimulate its mental ability. And I think um, the amount of plastic pollution in lots of places, you, you can always find plastic bottles. And in this instance, these were just sultanas that I'd stolen from the buffet in the hotel I was in. So very easy, but just making sure we're not forgetting that these animals are super intelligent and need stimulation they're not they're not going to cope well with being in captivity and we do see signs of if we're not providing proper enclosures designed for them and enrichment we do start to see self-harming and, and them becoming mentally drained so what's next is the big question so we're looking at creating an evidence-based risk assessment protocol and flowchart for new arrivals of mangabees so if it's a Sadly, a female mangabe that gets involved in a road traffic accident and passes away and it's her baby that obviously um, and was young that represents less risk than like yellow that's lived in a community for three or four years. And, that we, and just looking at how you 
uh, optimize the welfare and, and the kind of travel for those animals to, to get them in a position where they could be released. The plan is at some point, hopefully with Andrew's blessing, we'll carry out the health checks of the Mangabe group at Kamasi Zoo in, in situ in Ghana. Myself and two other, I think two other nurses and two other vets are going to go out um, and we're, we're going to yeah, carry that out in a day, hopefully. Um, this will be a huge opportunity for us to train and share knowledge and experience with the Ghanaian vets. We plan to record everything. One of the things that feels really counterintuitive, but looking at getting somebody that can record these things and document them so they can be used as a long-term resource, I think is really important. Now, we're so lucky that everybody has a mobile phone that has a decent camera on it now. These, these things can be so useful. Um, and after the first session, our plan is to write the protocols for further conservation translocations for WEPA. So put in place a document that allows this to be a pathway that could be used over the years to come with more mangabees. And what we'd really like to do is publish the whole thing. People, um, these, these type of work is being done in lots of different places around the world. But often people are reticent to share it. Um, the disease risk analysis takes time and costs money. So people often don't want to share it. And I think it's really important that we make these things open access and really document it, reference it, just get it out there so that other people can perhaps save some resources and, and jump a few steps to get to where they need to be. And that, that's the plan. So again, just to say, um, I, can't, I can't get across to you how incredibly um, yeah, wonderful the mangabees are. They're just such nice animals. And I think there's an opportunity for WAPCA and WVI to be ahead of the curve. That's what the aim of all of these things is to get these populations back before they get dwindled to such incredibly no, no, low numbers that it makes it practically impossible. Um, and working with WAPCO is yeah the, the future for that. So, okay, um, that's the end of my talk. I'll stop sharing my screen. If anybody's got any questions, and again, just thanks again to um, VETCT for allowing us to do this web, webinar and just really um, yeah sharing the work that we're doing in, in Ghana with the Mangabees. Okay, hope you can all see me now. Cool. So I'm absolutely fine to take any questions at all. If anybody's got any questions, please don't be shy. I don't know if we want to put them in the chat box, um, yep. Will Marie, or how you'd like to do it. Chat yeah, box is chat. fine. Yep. If anybody's got anything, that's fine. Um, if you get the chance to go to Ghana, I would go. It's a very nice country, very beautiful. Lots of nice things to see. Beautiful landscape, nice people. It's an excellent country. Just give it a few minutes while people think of awkward questions for me. Cool. What's WN, N, <laughs> WNM? Questions, the question was, are there any diseases in particular? Oh, oh right. okay. like that. Here we go. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I've never thought of abbreviating them. Um, uh, there's 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 lots of concerns, obviously, about zoonoses now. So that's a real um hot hot kind of topic. So they're looking at things like malaria and potentially primates being a reservoir for malaria. And we actually don't think they are. Um, I think the main ones that we're worried about are, are the ones that we worry about in primates everywhere, which is slim and insufficiency virus which does knock around in primates in most countries. And, and obviously Ebola, if it's in that country or has ever been in that country, that makes it a massive uh, zoonotic risk for the people involved. So, but the disease risk analysis has got, has identified about 12 different pathogens that we need to be screening for. Some of which we can screen in country if they're um, diseases that are shared with humans, often there's bench side snap tests, but some of those things will be, yeah, will be have to be moved around. So. So yeah, um, yeah. So the, the 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 local people are incredibly supportive. So they, we just, I think it's very easy to, um, it, it's very easy to just kind of judge those situations. And I think it's just making sure that there's initiatives in place to be able to support them. I think what what's um, one of the initiatives that the Ghanaian government did was to give people. Uh, 
to give them warthog babies to rear. So to stop them from um, eating primates, they gave them a pair of warthogs. And it was their decision as to whether they grew the warthogs up to a size that they could eat them and then ate them, or they decided that they kept them and let them have babies and then perhaps went on and eat, ate their babies. So it sounds pretty kind of root one, but it, it alleviated the need for them to reach out into the forest to, to get primates to eat. So it's quite a, quite a good initiative. So yeah, they're incredibly supportive. I've, I've always felt incredibly welcome, incredibly safe. Um, and culturally, they're 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 very proud of their their um, their primates. So they 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 want to do everything they can. So it's just about making sure we engage in, with them in the right way. So WAP could do lots of stuff with school children. So talking to them about the the life of the forest, they appoint these kind of ambassadors, primate ambassadors in the different communities who um, are allowed to take guns off of people. I'm not 100 percent sure how that works. But they're, if they catch somebody in the forest with a gun, they're empowered by the government to just take the gun off them. Uh, they can then sell the gun, which gives them a little bit of income as well. So um, it, it, there's lots of initiatives around it that supported it. But it is about not just taking away a resource without supplying it with something else. So um, I'm happy to talk about anything. So, <laughs> so I don't mind talking about other animals. We did talk do a sea turtle one, but yeah, very happy to, to talk about other things. But um, the main thing is, is if you can support us, if people can make donations to Wildlife Vets International, that'd be great. And and yeah, keep keep in touch with Vet CT because they're doing some great work to support us um, in our various projects. So, I'm gonna put that link on there as well for the survey while we're on supporting, so we can get some. Uh... Thank oh. you. And yeah, have a look at that. Um, I don't know if Wilmarie, if you can share that link. To, that explains about the the cremas the cremas so um it's just a really interesting youtube clip i can send it to you on an email if you like and you can just yeah that, that that'll be great and we'll uh, we'll follow up with obviously the recording as well so we can put all the links in there cool. as well yeah just great get that up any other questions from anyone no okay, okay. brilliant as I say, you can contact me through Wildlife Vets International, but also through Vet CT. But yeah, if you've got any other questions that pop up, then send them through to, to Wilmarie and she'll get them to me and I promise I'll answer them. So, okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone.